Uh, you guys remember this old buggy. A lot of people watch the channel for buggy content, I understand. We're getting closer. She's uh, in front of the shop now, which is a lot better than it's been. Let's get started. Welcome back to Spank Ranch Garage. Tonight we are finally getting some time to get back on the mid-engine turbo buggy project, utilizing this GM LE2 1.4 liter direct injected engine. I have a video uh, from almost a year ago now, me pulling this engine out, getting it running on the floor. And then I have some videos about me building a custom Subaru transmission that will ultimately be bolted to this at some point. So you can go check them out if you have questions about that. But tonight's goal is to get this thing ready for standalone and off-road use. It's going to include figuring out a belt routing setup up here. I want to block off the vacuum pump on the rear of the engine. And then I want to go around and take off all the unnecessary emissions related and road car related stuff. Shout out to Henderson Equipment for the free beer. Thank you for that. First thing we need to work out here is the serpentine belt setup. So from the factory, you'd have an AC compressor hanging over on this corner here, and the belt routing was very different. So here's a picture of the belt routing. You see it comes up over the top of the alternator, over the water pump, down around the AC compressor, around the crank, and then tensioner, and back. Without the AC compressor here, we kind of miss that whole section here tensioner is not going to work in its current location. It's important to remember that this engine turns clockwise, right, this direction. The tensioner needs to be on the slack side of the belt. So my first, like, my first thought was, oh yeah, I'll just wrap it around here, up over and down, and boom, we're done. Unfortunately, the angles don't work for that, and that would not put this tensioner on the slack side of the belt. So my next thought was to unbolt it from here, build some type of bracket, put it over here, because this is the slack side. But I think we have an even better solution for that. And it's going to be a little lengthy, but it will use all factory parts around that. And this is just a belt from my spare parts pile. Um, I'll have to get a belt that's the correct length. But what you see here, this is actually a pretty good setup, right? So you have good amount, you have over a quarter of a pulley of wrap on the water pump. The water pump's a really low load accessory. It doesn't need a lot of belt wrap on it. You're not worried about slip. That's fine there. We have a ton of wrap on the crank, probably more than you'll ever need. And then we will have about 180 degrees of wrap on the alternator, which is awesome. And the tensioner is acting in the proper direction in this orientation. So looking through my spare used belt pile, I don't have any five rib belts. The Chevy Cruze here apparently uses a five rib belt. I've got fours and I've got sixes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this six rib down to a five rib, and then we're gonna stretch it on here as close as we can, and then we'll determine our length. I've, I've done this in the past. I haven't had a lot of luck wrapping a string around it and getting the right belt on the first try, but this belt is of known length. This is 1535, I believe that's 1535 millimeters. Uh, so then if we know that's close, we can say, oh, I need another inch, I need another whatever. So with this razor blade in the vise here, we're going to take off the extra rib that we don't need. This is actually a pretty valuable trick. I've used this in the past many times to make custom belts for cars that we didn't have the right belt at the time being or whatever. You could do this with vice grips in a pinch. Just like that, we've now got a five rib belt to play with. Tensioner all the way bottomed out. We're still not quite making it over the top of the alternator there. But I think another inch or inch and a half would do us well on this. So I'm gonna go hunt around at my local parts store, see if they've got anything that'll work for me. Just came back from AutoZone, I guess is these. Yeah, AutoZone, they're left. Anyway, so belt numbers, right? So. Like I said, always start with a numbered belt, or a, always start with a known length belt. So this belt we started with is a 6PK1535, meaning it's a six rib. 
1535 millimeter working length. Now, of course, AutoZone likes to deal in the standard numbers. So this is a 62.0 inch six rib belt, um, which equals a, a 1575. The problem is sometimes they can't look it up by this number. So you gotta do the conversion, bring it to a number they understand, tell the guy how everything works, whatever. Anyway, this is a 1575, so 570 or 1575 effective length. Um, so that should give me about an inch and a half extra length. Problem is they do not have a five rib of this. AutoZone doesn't stock it. So I'm gonna go with the six rib, but before I cut it, I wanna test fit it and see if it's close because once I cut it, I can't bring it back. Honestly, I probably could bring it back because they don't know what they're looking at, but I wouldn't be that kind of guy, not for an $18 belt. So let's see if this fits. That fits well, everything clears. We have amazing belt wrap on the alternator. As good as you're gonna get on the crank. Plenty for the water pump. Tensioner's in the right spot on the slack side. That will do it. Uh, I think you could grab a, a little longer belt, so a uh, maybe a 625 you'd be good with, or a, what's that gonna come out to? Like a, a 1590 or so. Might be a little easier to get on, but once you run this thing and that stretches a smidge bit, that'll be nice and easy. So at any time you're doing kind of work like this, you identify the belt that works, then you go see what it fits. And you do that on Rock Auto. If you go up to the part number search, type in the part number, and then see what that fits. So I see that this belt fits an 04 to 09 Audi A4. They're pretty common. But even better is the Chrysler Intrepid here, 98, 99. Intrepid, Ford Fusion, 14 to 20. So it fits cars that are fairly common on the road. It means you'll find this at most of your local parts stores, not a special order. Because one of the big things with this buggy is that I always use it in remote locations. I'm never using it near a city where people are driving like 8 Series BMWs and whatever else. So um, I also see on Rock Auto they do make a 60 or 620 K5 apparently fits some early Chevy Aveos. Uh, you know, you'd probably be hard pressed to find that in stock somewhere, but if you didn't want to cut a belt, you just want to order a couple on Rock Auto, there it is. It's 620K5. That will work for you. Two different manufacturers for that. Anyway, all right, that was easy. Let's move on to the rest. Next thing you want to do for off-roading or non-emissions use will be block off this vacuum pump. I have a video on this vacuum pump. Look through my videos if you're curious of how it works, but either way, it's not going on an off-road buggy. There's no purpose to it. So um, I wanna block this off. There's three critical surfaces that need to be blocked. One is the main bore from the camshaft here. The second one is this oil feed, the one with the screen here. That needs to be blocked off. And then finally the oil drain, which is here, that needs to be blocked off as well. Bush actually gives me some of this template cardboard with every purchase, so I do appreciate that. Play will work to patch up the oil holes, like we said, though we do still have to deal with the cam sealing surface. So I need to locate that on the plate, then I'm gonna bore it, put a plug in it, weld it into the plate, I think. Decided to get rid of the seal. It's just another failure point, so I'm just gonna leak over time. Turned a piece to 53 millimeters. Fits perfectly in here. <clears throat> and then, I put a bolt through it and I cut a point on the bolt. So I'm gonna use that to locate this unit. I traded in the longer vacuum pump bolts for shorter ones. And then when I bolt this up, this should leave a pretty definitive center point mark on the back of this. And then I will have this three bolt to center bore relationship plotted out here. And then I'm either gonna bolt this to it, weld it to it or whatever. All right, and then that left a perfect punch mark right where the center 
of the cam is. So now I can attach this thing to this thing and we've got a block off plate. So here's what we ended up with. This is my vacuum pump block off plate. You know, I could have just welded this bore closed and welded all these other holes closed. Then you got this hunky piece of crap on the back of the motor. This is nice and simple, slim, very lightweight. That just slides into cam hole on the back of the motor. You hit it with your three bolts, a little bit of RTV around the cam hole. Um, and then I'm, I'm gonna reuse the factory gasket for the bottom holes. And that should be it. Quick, simple, easy. There's a lot of ways to do this. I definitely took like a roundabout way to make this, but it turned out awesome, so this will work good. All right, so we give a walk around this motor and say, what else don't we need here for off-roading? Now this thing is wildly complicated compared to the air-cooled Volkswagen that came out of this. And we'll see if I regret it or not. Um, but anyway, everything left on this side is actually essential. So if you've got turbo, wastegate, electronic blow off valve, which I need a plug for, that was gone. Boost control solenoid. These two wires down here for air conditioning, these can be stripped from the harness. Coming up over this way, uh, vacuum pump related crap, that can go. We've got evaporative emissions over here that can also go. Mass airflow throttle body, all four coil packs, and then starter, single fuel feed on these, just one, it's a returnless system. Um, you've got rail pressure sensor here, and then it goes up through your high pressure pump, and then you've got high pressure rail sensor up here. All absolutely essential stuff, this motor is direct injected. This is where my coolant overflow would go. These would be your two heater core lines here. I need to see if I need to loop these or block them. And then unfortunately, this is my radiator discharge, which is just in a crappy location for a rear wheel drive setup. Not a lot I could do about it though. It looks like it's an electronically, con electronically controlled thermostat. Uh, you've got your bypass line here, your turbo cooler lines come off of that. One of them drains to the block, the other one comes off the bypass. So it looks like a lot going on here, but this is not a wildly complicated engine. Um, it's just complicated compared to the little air-cooled 1600 that came out of this thing. I'm gonna wrap up part one here with prepping this uh, 1.4 liter for off-road use. Next episode, we're gonna have, we're gonna be playing with clutches, flywheels, pressure plates, clutch discs, etc and try to come up with a combo that's going to work for the Subaru transmission. So stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching Spank Ranch Garage. See you soon.